delighted to have Tom Hickey, who's going to give a paper that gives the Irish perspective on, on republicanism. Uh, and so, Tom, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Um, you have 20 minutes to maybe pick up and highlight some of the themes of your paper, which we can then open up for discussion. So over to you, Tom. Well, thank you very, very much, um, Aileen, and thank you to the Devolution Club. I, I think I might begin with a tweet from Conor O'Mahony. I think Conor might be logged on this morning. And for the Irish in the audience, you might have seen his tweet last week. So Conor tweeted about a, a decision that was handed down by the Irish Supreme Court nearly 40 years ago um, in the spring of 1983, a case called Norris and the Attorney General. And it was a decision, a case involving a guy, David Norris, who took a, a, a challenge to the constitutionality of legislation that made it a criminal offence to engage in homosexual uh, relations. And David Norris lost in the Supreme Court in a 3-2 judgment, split court, 3-2. And it's looked back upon as a kind of a, a very low point in the history or the record of the Irish Supreme Court. And it was in that context that Connor was tweeting about it um, last week. Um, he said in his tweet that he, when he's teaching constitutional law, these days that he deliberately dwells on the offensive passages of the judgments, excuse me, the majority judgments in the case. And that although not nice to hear, they're nevertheless an effective way to show students how wrong courts can be, how wrong courts can be. If we only teach about the judgments we like, he says, and not the ones we would prefer never happened, then we risk placing the courts on a pedestal they don't deserve. Now, I agree with uh, Connor. I like the tweet and I teach Norris this for the same reasons um, when I teach my students constitutional law. But what I was interested about in this tweet was what Connor might be thought to have meant when he used the word wrong, you know, in the in the tweet. Um, because if he means the following, well, then I agree with him without hesitation. Right. If he if he meant that the reasoning in Norris in O'Higgins's majority judgment, for instance, was informed by injustice, okay? And the outcome was unjust. I agree without hesitation. But if he meant wrong as a matter of constitutional law, it's a bit trickier, I think, you know? If it was an interpretation this summer of 2021 of, of the constitution that's fixed now in the public space for the time being, this summer, it would be wrong as a matter of constitutional law because of the amendment, of course, but for lots of other reasons too, having to do with the constitution. But to say it's wrong um, of the constitution that was fixed in the public space in the spring of 1983 is just a bit, a bit trickier. I'd like to think I would have been in dissent. It's kind of horrifying to think otherwise, but who can say really, you know, uh, uh, and it was not an implausible interpretation. I guess I put it like that. But I bring it up to start with here, uh, because to me, it kind of helps bring out a distinction that I'm really trying to figure out, I suppose, in this paper, you know, between justice and legitimacy. OK, so it's legitimacy, stupid, not justice, if you like. You know, so to me, the Norris case is about justice, the concept or injustice if you like, um, whereas I'm interested in the idea of legitimacy and I'm, I'm persuaded broadly by those scholars. I think they're led really by A. John Simmons, um, uh, who insists that these things, these concepts, justice and legitimacy are, are they're interrelated, but they're conceptually distinct. Um, and, and I'm wondering whether we can uh, understand our constitution better, whether it be the Italian constitution, the Irish constitution or a Republican constitution, better in the light of this distinction. And I guess specifically what I'm uh, wondering or trying to figure here is whether a constitution might be understood as a legitimacy pact, as a Republican contract for legitimacy, um, if you like. And so, so um, for a living, breathing, actual people, you know, as well, a legitimacy pact for a living, breathing, actual, not hypothetical people, which I, I'll try to 
to work in here as we go. So in the spirit of a conversation, you know, I thought this is an Italian Irish conversation is what you pitched it at, which is great for me. And that allows me to be a little more casual maybe than I normally would be. So I thought I'd bring up the example of my neighbor and I'm pointing because he's right next door, my neighbor, Dave. Okay. So, and he, he we're both lucky to have South facing back gardens. So we're out in the garden lots. And uh, Dave is a lockdown skeptic. Okay. Um, uh, not a crazy lockdown. You know, he's, he's, he's a data based lockdown skeptic and, and i'm and when i talk about constitution as a legitimacy pact i'm asking you to think you know, dave is not gay but imagine he was okay and imagine it's the spring or the summer of 1983 and we're talking about this we're having a public political exchange as it were as we often do um, uh, over the fence and he says to me tom you know he says you're the lawyer you know, what is that law? I say it's section 61 of the Offences Against the Person Act 1861. He says, yeah, well, that law, he said, I find it humiliating. It's egregious. It's unjust. And uh, I say, well, I, I, you might be right and you might be wrong. It might be just or it might be unjust. But as it happens, Dave, you know, last spring, uh, the Irish Supreme Court ruled three judges to two and so on. Now, I just parked that there because that is the hardest example, the case I can think of to, as an obstacle against the suggestion that a constitution could be a legitimacy pact. Like, what do you think Dave is going to say to me back over the fence? So let's tweak the, tweak the facts a little bit and imagine that Dave is very religious. He's not, but imagine he was. And it's really important for him to go to mass every Sunday. And it's now the summer of 2020. And because of lockdown, he can't go to mass every Sunday. And he's data driven. He says to me, Tom, you know, the height of churches, the space in there, the demographic that goes to mass, you know, this is a very, very regulatable setting. This is this. I can't think this is wrong. This this law is wrong. It's uh, it's unjust. Uh, and I say, well, you know, you might be right. I, I think he might be right. You might be right. You might be wrong. It might be just. It might be unjust. But as it happens, Dave, a guy called Declan Ganley took a case. And just last month, it went to the Supreme Court. Now, I'm exaggerating slightly at this point. It went all to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled by five judges to two that the law in question that you're talking about does not breach Article 44 on religious freedom, which is a really robust protection of religious freedom. And therefore, Dave, what I'm saying to you is that you should not make me feel badly for exerting social pressure on you or contributing to the exertion of social pressure on you to conform to that law right so that's the idea of legitimacy okay that he can accept um something that he thinks unjust and i'm wondering can a constitution um as it were sit there in the background as something we can point at as a legitimacy pact if you like and uh, i those two examples so you've got the norris example if you like and the religious freedom example and I, I, you just think for a second to yourself, you know, what, what do you think Dave is going to say back to me over the fence? You know, is he going to say, oh, well, OK, Tom, I didn't know, you know, but I accept. Um, not, not so much, I guess, particularly the Norris example. Uh, but the idea uh, comes up in John Rawls, Political Liberalism, Lecture 4, right, where he says, you know, our exercise of political power is fully proper. OK, in other words, we don't need to feel badly about ourselves. Our exercise of political power is fully proper only when it is exercised in accordance with the Constitution. The essentials of which all citizens as free and equal may reasonably be expected, may, may reasonably be expected to endorse in light of the principles and ideas acceptable to their common human reason. This is the liberal principle of legitimacy. So I'm, I'm suggesting in this paper, right, that doesn't work. That Rawlsian um, sense of constitution as a legitimacy pact is problematic because it's like as if I'm saying to Dave across the fence, you know, you might think the constitution's wrong, that you might think the judges were wrong to interpret the constitution that way, but you're wrong to think they're wrong and therefore you should stand down. So I am I'm I am defining legitimacy in terms of justice. And this is what A. John Simmons said of John Rawls. I think I, I don't know if I said that, that Simmons says Rawls is responsible above all else, above anyone else, for this tendency to conflate legitimacy and justice in contemporary political theory. So another reason it's problematic related to that is it kind of has a hypothetical ring to it rather than actual hypothetical sense of legitimacy. Effectively, I'm saying to, to Dave over the fence, you know, Dave, um, 
you don't know about this guy, John Rawls, but I do. And uh, he came up with this wonderful idea called the original position, the veil of ignorance. You don't know if you're gay or straight or religious or not. And you, you and I, Dave, had we been there, we would have come up with something like this, Article 44 and Article 40, and we would have come up with judicial review as a way of kind of figuring out disputes and so on. And that's what's happened here. So now, Dave, you should stand down and not make me feel badly, you know. So how do you think Dave is going to react? It doesn't seem to work, if you like. And then the final reason it doesn't seem to work to me is that it seems to have in mind the idea of a fixed constitution. This kind of maybe recalls um, uh, Roberto's point, uh, um, something that struck me in Roberto's wonderful paper, but it seems to have in mind the notion of a constitution, the basic, the, the essentials of which are fixed in advance, is set in constitutional stone, if you like, um, um, set once and for all is a direct quotation from that same chapter of Rawls's political liberalism. And to me, uh, as a Republican, that's tricky. In fact, I would say that's very problematic for a Republican, as I would understand it, uh, because the Republican is interested in the living, breathing, actual people of a given summer, as it were, uh, not hypothetical people set in advance, constitutionalism set in advance of democracy, if you like. So that's why it mightn't work. Um, uh, and why might it work then? Or how might we conceive of a constitution such that it could work as a legitimacy pact? And I guess I've just two arguments, two kind of sets of arguments for this. Uh, the first is kind of something structural or concrete about a constitution, our constitution, the, the Irish constitution, the amendment um, provision. So Article 46 and 47, which people I think will be familiar with. Um, you know, and the most striking word for me in those provisions is the first word of the first sub of subsection, any, any provision of this constitution may be amended. And I think that's practically important. And we've seen lots and lots, 35 or 40 amendments over the years, some of them very significant. Um, but it's also symbolically important in the sense that it conveys to the living, breathing people that there's no sense in which there was an, a would-be arrogant founding generation, you know, that, 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 that deprived the citizenry of ongoing control over their constitution, you know. So um, there was that exchange between Habermas and Rawls in the mid-90s after political liberalism, where Habermas talked about, you know, the... the the, the living, breathing citizens is my phrase, but something along those lines, um, cannot reignite. Well, I'm suggesting that this provision means that the, the Irish citizen can reignite uh, the radical democratic embers um, of the original position in the civic life of their community as they go, right? So, so that's something structural or practical. And then the, that, that, that tends to lend support to this notion. And then the other thing, I, 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 structural or practical is is this kind of so-called referendum culture and I, on this now i rely on on aileen's paper david kenny rachel's work with oran um and so on like uh, around citizens assemblies and and not only citizens assemblies but like the, the the referendum culture that has emerged developed i suppose um since maybe the early 80s or or before McKenna principles in the 90s and referendum commission and this expectations that the public have now of, you know, for significant constitutional change that they will begin perhaps with a, a citizen led deliberative mini public and so on. These kinds of things, again, tends to support this thesis that the people have a sense of ownership, as I think Aileen and David put it, or authorship even with respect to their constitution. And uh, that ties in with Jeff King's idea from his democratic case for a written constitution in the UK. So they're kind of practical, structural. Another little phrase from David and Aileen's paper, incidentally, is the people as part of, as key parts of an ongoing iterative process of democratic constitutions, which I like. So then there's this other abstract uh, sense of it, uh, or if you understand the constitution in a more abstract way, that I think lends support to it. And the phrase that I hit upon I was, as I was putting that draft together um, um, recently was um, constitution as a repository. Constitution as a repository for the time being of commonly avowable norms, let's say, or constitution as proxy for the time being of reasons that we might sincerely believe others will reasonably accept if you like, or the final one, constitution as um, uh, something we can all rally around, 
OK, so I was trying to work these ideas out and I was exchanging my draft with Davy Lawler, who I think is on the line, um, a PhD candidate in DCU. And he pointed out to me that Donald O'Donnell, the incoming chief justice, had, had just given a paper. This is just last week. He had given the paper, I think, to the Bar Council called A Constitution as Something We Can All Rally Around. And I read O'Donnell's paper and it's a quote from Mary Wollstonecraft, um, actually. But in that paper, in Donald O'Donnell's paper, he talked a lot about Linda Colley's book, which many of you will have read, The Gun, the Ship and the Sea. And I was really struck when I read this paper, actually just this weekend, that um, Donald O'Donnell had used a line that I perhaps underlined with the most enthusiasm when I read Linda Colley's book in the last month or two. Um, it was, you know, that the constitution or a constitution might be understood as like a novel this is, you know, this is one line that I like. Like a novel, it invents and tells the story of a place and a people, which is Linda Colley. Or Donald O'Donnell says, a story about ourselves and how we would like to be perceived, that is, at our best. That's O'Donnell's twist on Linda Colley. And the line that I underlined from Linda Colley was she was talking about well-functioning or durable constitutions, and not all of them are, of course. As if you've read her book, you'll see that more starkly than maybe you might have thought, certainly for me. Um, but well-functioning constitutions are characterized by, quote, the degree to which politicians, the law courts, not judges, the, the law courts, politicians, and the population concerned are able and willing to put sustained effort into thinking about them. You know, not just revising, but actually thinking about them, bringing them into the public political discourse, you know, like me and Dave over the fence and so on, you know, so... Um, and, and, and revising them where necessary and making them work. And Donald O'Donnell says the business of constitutional law is not the plaything of constitutional lawyers. So it's in that sense that I'm thinking in that more abstract understanding of constitution that that constitution might be plausibly understood as legitimacy pact. And I'll finish then. I'm assuming I have time to finish with um, Philip Pettit. So, um, and his Republican conception of legitimacy understood as equally shared popular control, equally shared popular control. And in the draft, I give a kind of a three line or four line synopsis of what that is means perhaps. And it's like, there's a lot of complexity to it and it's very contestable and so on. Um, but the most interesting feature of it for me in this context is the overtime feature. Right, you know, that kind of temporal feature of Republican democracy, you might think of it as democracy fast and slow. And the idea that I'm trying to get at here is that if at any moment in time, the summer of 19, 2021 or whatever, if at any moment in time you take a step back from the social order, like the social order being like all of the laws and policies and exercises of political power and so on that's in play, everything that has to do with justice or injustice, if you like. And you step back from you say, well, inevitably, for any one of us, you're going to say, well, I really, really, that troubles me deeply. I, I object to that and so on. I disagree with that. I'm neutral on this. I really like that and so on. You win and lose all the time. Um, and this overtime notion is not at all that we might get to a point where there is no disagreement, or we should never aspire to that, wouldn't be democratic, it wouldn't be a free citizenry in that kind of scenario. But rather it is that I can step back and I can say, well, I've lost here and I've lost there and I've lost there quite badly. But over time, I can see that the direction that things are going, the social order is being imposed by, or is being, if you like, influenced by um, norms that I can relate to, right? Norms that I share or norms that I, sincerely believe others would accept and so on uh, and it's in that sense if we think of constitution as a repository for commonly available norms right that's the sense i have in mind of the possibility that a constitution a republican constitution could plausibly represent a legitimacy pact thank you Wonderful, Tom. Thanks. You've added a, uh, some new layers of richness now to the discussion, which I think uh, will be fascinating. And you also finished it, uh, you know, right on time. So that's also wonderful. Um, I'm sure we all have questions. 
Uh, but I'll hand over now, now to Professor Justin Prosini, um, who's going to give uh, some commentary and questions on Tom's paper um, for about 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll withdraw now, but when I reappear, um, uh, th that's a sign that we can move to the next stage of the discussion. So thank you very much, uh, Justin.